Good day, everyone. Randy Franklin Smith here. Today we are talking about a big subject, and that is everything to do with passwords in Active Directory. I want to thank Spec Ops for making today's real training for free possible. And um, there, you know, you guys are the perfect sponsor for what we're talking about today because your solutions are centered around all things related to Active Directory passwords. I've got with me here Darren Siegel. Darren, thanks for coming uh, again, and um, I know you eat, sleep, and breathe AD passwords, so please jump in here and there with, with some good color commentary. Will do. Thanks for uh, helping us set this up, Randy. All right, so here's what we're going to talk about uh, with regard to passwords in Windows or Active Directory. Where are they stored? How are they stored? How are they controlled? How do we authenticate them? And how can you audit them? Then we're going to talk about how our passwords attacked in uh, Active Directory. Now, given the breadth of subjects we're going to drill down into, this is going to be a fast-moving webinar. But I can tell you that anything we talk about today, you can find more information on my site. Uh, we've done webinars on every single one of these topics, including uh, some others with uh, Spec Ops related, especially to password policy. So we'll include a link to that as we're going along here. First of all, where are passwords stored in Active Directory? Um, and just in Windows at large, let's just start there. Before we drill down, before we focus on Active Directory, the real topic here, it's just worth giving honorable mention to local accounts because don't ever forget that every Windows system out there has its own set of local accounts stored in what they call the SAM, the Security Account Manager database. It's a hive file of the registry. There's the uh, physical file location of it there. And of course, there are hashes with those accounts. Now, um, that's uh, probably the first and last time we're going to talk about local accounts today because obviously today is about Active Directory. And um, Active Directory domain accounts are stored along with the rest of the Active Directory database in this particular folder right here. Um, and this particular file, nts.dit, that is where your Active Directory LDAP database resides. And of course, um, the hashes of your passwords are stored there. Now I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit because uh, we'll get into that under how are they stored, but um, just right off the bat, I don't want anybody new to Active Directory thinking that the clear text passwords are stored in AD. Now the, these hashes of the passwords, remember um, this is a database. Databases have to be backed up. S certainly, hopefully, you are backing up Active Directory. And therefore, we have to expect that bad guys could find a copy of those hashes in those backups, including things like volume shadow copies. So then what it comes down to is you're right away thinking about security. And the good news is on the nts.dit file, that file is always opened exclusively by the operating system. So the prerequisites to getting a copy of this copy of your password hashes um, are fairly hefty, and that is they require domain admin authority, and then you know, the ability to run specialized executables and scripts on the domain controller with that domain admin authority. Uh, things like Mimikatz, for instance or you've got to have access to the backups. Now, just remember, once you have nts.dit, you don't have the passwords, you have the hashes. Let's talk about hashing. So hashing is not encryption. I don't like the term one-way encryption. That's not what it is. Hashing is a message digest uh, 
it, it involves the use of a message digest algorithm. And message digests are used for lots of purposes. Commonly, um, for a non-security reason, message digests are just used to make sure that a transmitted message is received accurately, a copy of it is received accurately, or that data stored is uh, accurate bit for bit. That, you know, message digest. The idea with that is change one bit in the message or the file being digested, and you should get a different hash. Um, of course, there is a collision space with um, potentially multiple messages yielding the same hash, but it is um, unpredictable, and um, uh, the, you know the math works out that the hash is still valuable. Now, the idea with using hashes on passwords is that um, you know the clear text password and the risks associated with it are eliminated, and we just have the hash. The further idea being that it's very difficult, should be very difficult, to get from the hash back to the clear text password, and you, and having the hash should not ideally be useful to you. However, as you'll see when we get to pass the hash, it, it turns out that having the hash is actually quite valuable. Um, the good news is this used to be a really big deal. Uh, password hashing and the ability to crack passwords in Windows. It's still um, it, it's still possible, but it's nowhere as easy as it used to be. And that's because um, land manager hashes are not stored by default anymore in Active Directory. You have to specifically turn that feature on. So if you are up to date with you know the more recent versions of Active Directory 2016 and forward, and if you've changed your passwords since upgrading, then you don't have those land manager hashes out there anymore. Land manager hashes did not live up to the ideals by any stretch of the imagination that I uh, was just discussing with regard to hashes. They were uh, relatively easy to reverse. NT hashes, not so much. They're still not ideal. For instance, uh, the NT hash does not use uh, salt, but it's still uh, relatively expensive from a computing point of view to crack NT hashes. Um, but let's just stop and think here for a second. The only source of hashes that we've discussed so far is NTS.dit. And if, you've, if you can get the nts.dit file, then you've already lost the battle a long time ago because of the prerequisites involved in the level of access that you must have achieved if you've gotten nts.dit. Furthermore, as we've pointed out, getting the clear text passwords and um, uh, by cracking them from the hashes, it, it, that would be great but most attackers just use the hashes themselves. Okay, but nts.dit is not the only place where you can find um, nt hashes. When you log on with a domain account on any Windows system, of course, the operating system has to process that password that you type in and then hash it and then keep it in memory so that you can be authenticated to systems on the domain. And that's in the LSAS, sorry, LSASS uh, process, the local security system service. And um, those hashes stick around for a long time, um, even sometimes after you've logged off. Now, these hashes, are, um, since they're in memory, and since that is a you know, highly protected system service, it's not trivial to get them. But if the user has admin authority to their local system, and if their, their session has been compromised through any means that allows the attacker to achieve MITRE attack execution technique, the execution technique, then um, 
pass the hash attacks are, uh, are, are an option for the attacker at that point because they can run something like Mimikatz, which uses various fairly sophisticated techniques to inject code into the LSA system service process and access those hashes in that protected memory. Beyond those hashes stored in the LSASS memory, there are also cache credentials. So many of you, if you have a Windows laptop, have logged on to that laptop with a uh, domain account um, when you're not connected to the network, like when you're up in a plane. The reason that works is cached credentials. Now, the actual account hash is not stored there, so that's good news. Instead, a uh, derivative of that hash is. Um, it's not useful for, for pass the hash attacks. It is uh, subject to cracking. Um, you know what it comes down to with password cracking today is unless you've got unlimited computing, um, well, you know what? We'll talk more about that when we get to uh, cracking. There's one more place you should think about, and that is saved credentials. So Microsoft has put a lot of work into protecting saved credentials in this locker. But at the end of the day, there is a copy of the clear text password um, available if all of the encryption on the uh, locker is defeated. And so really the only mitigation there is using some of the security options in group policy to disable the use of saved credentials for network locations, for network locations. Now, um, a copy of the password hash, and sometimes even the clear text password, comes up again when we talk about synchronization and replication. So between domain controllers, we have replication. That is a complete copy of Active Directory is replicated to all domain controllers, right? And that includes read-only domain controllers. So replication traffic itself, as in uh, if you capture the, the, the packets, lacks significant known vulnerabilities. But um, replication itself can be abused if we gain domain admin authority. So if we gain domain and admin authority, we can use the DC sync type of attack, which we'll talk about later, to be an imposter domain controller. And that means we can either trick the rest of the domain into sending us important information like password hashes or accepting uh, changes that we are uh, claiming have been executed against Active Directory. So we'll talk more about DC sync when we get to the attacks. Uh, section. Um, between Active Directory and other identity systems such as Azure Active Directory, you don't have replication. What you have is uh, synchronization, in particular password synchronization. So this is another attack point, right? Um, if we're talking about Azure AD, then um, we're talking about attacking the system where Azure AD Connect runs. So that program runs on some server in your network and then provides synchronization um, up to Azure AD and potentially back down, depending on your hybrid environment. Um, the good news is the actual Active Directory hash is not sent or stored in Azure Active Directory. Um, what, um, what Azure AD Connect does instead is use your Active Directory NT hash to compute a new hash um, that is significantly stronger and includes salt. And it's, it's not useful in a reverse attack against AD with known uh, attack techniques. But if we could compromise the system where Azure AD Connect is running, that would be highly valuable, so keep that in mind. So how are passwords controlled in Active Directory? We talked about where they're stored, how they're stored. We've also talked about where you can find them when they are in motion. But now let's talk about how are 
passwords controlled. We're talking primarily about password policy here. And um, Active Directory gives you some, I would say, rudimentary policies on passwords. You can specify a minimum password length. You can specify password age requirements um, to force passwords to be changed on a regular basis. You can um, implement some fairly ham-fisted policies over the content of the password, namely that it has to be so-called complex, uh, drawing from a, uh, several different classes of characters. You can also implement a lockout policy. So all of these um, have a degree of value, but there is no consensus in the industry about what the proper password policy is. And you may be subject to your own uh, enterprise or organization uh, policies with regard to password policy anyway, which may or may not um, agree with some of the latest guidance, such as from uh, the NIST. So we did a whole webinar on that, um, Darren, and uh, we did it with you guys. Remember that one, Active Directory Password Management, understanding the controls, the risks, and the gaps. Oh yeah, that was uh, that was a great one. You went into a into great detail on, on Active Directory and fine grained password policies and all that. And and of course we help um, bolster what AD can do, which we talked about in that webinar. And we'll see some of that again uh, later today when we get into that. Yeah. Um, and so there's you know there there's quite a few policies, but um, at the end of the day, you're fairly limited on what you can do with the uh, policies out of the box, with the functionality out of the box with Active Directory. But the good news is um, you are allowed to um, implement third-party solutions through basically a plug-in architecture called password filters and notification packages. And if you're serious about password quality and implementing granular password uh, uh, requirements, then that's, that's the direction you have to go, and Spec Ops has a lot to offer there. Now, how does Windows use passwords then to actually perform authentication? Obviously, since it's not the clear text password stored in the database in Active Directory, then we're not simply taking the candidate password that the user enters at logon and then comparing it character for character for the clear text password stored in the database because it's not there instead of hashes. So what happens is when a user attempts to log on, they enter their password, Windows immediately sends that candidate password through the very same hash algorithm. Now they have a hash. And if you are logging on to the, to the same system where your account is stored. So that is if you're, let's say you're an admin and you're at the console of a domain controller and you're, and you're logging on with a domain account, then yes, it would just compare the password hash, the candidate hash to that hash stored in um, Active Directory with your account. If you're logging on over the network though, uh, Microsoft wisely does not just send your hash over the network for it to be compared there because then it would be subject to very trivial eavesdropping techniques. Instead, an authentication protocol is uh, used. And there's two main authentication protocols in Windows, NTLM and Kerberos. Now we're going to drill down into each one of those in subsequent slides. I want to give honorable mention to two other protocols, and that's LDAP and HTTP, uh, HTTP basic authentication. So it's just worth noting that um, it's possible in your organization, applications have been set up that rely on, uh, that leverage Active Directory accounts for allowing the user to log on to the application, 
but then um, the back end of the application communicates with Active Directory um, either with LDAP with a simple bind request in order to verify the user's credential or they may um, accept the clear text password entered into say a web form or a um, IE, uh, not, well, IE any browser uh, dialog box and then that clear text password is used for authentication. And um, it's important to identify any applications where you're using that and then take steps to uh, mitigate them. But really, when we talk about Active Directory, the two authentication protocols we should focus on are the two that are built in, that Windows systems use for authenticating um, between systems in a domain. And the first one is the legacy one, NTLM. This is a proprietary authentication protocol with its roots way back in the 90s, uh, maybe even earlier than the 90s, with a product most of us don't even know about, and likely um, uh, many of us were born after uh, the product went away, and that's Land Manager. But that was Microsoft's and IBM's first take on uh, Land software. At any rate, um, it has its roots back there, and because of that, a ton of vulnerabilities have been discovered over the years and progressively bandaged by Microsoft. Um, NTLM is still enabled today uh, and available for authentication in Windows domains. Thankfully, it's not what Windows tries to use out of the box, but there are definitely scenarios where it falls back to using NTLM. And those are, A, you're logging into a remote system using a local account on that system. So now Active Directory isn't even part of the picture. Or you're logging on to another system on the network, so you're logging on over the network, but um, it's from an untrusted computer, meaning it's a computer that's not in the local domain or in the Active Directory forest or another uh, externally trusted domain. Or you're trying to log on to an application that doesn't use Kerberos. There's a few other situations where NTLM can come up. You may be on a client system accessing another server and both systems are in the uh, local domain, but um, in your uh, logon command, as in net use, for instance, from the command prompt, you specify the IP address of the server instead of its server name. Well, Kerberos cannot help you in that case, and so Windows will uh, graciously fall back to NTLM. So the point is there are a number of situations where NTLM um, is still used, still comes up on uh, your typical Windows network. So is that important? Well, certainly because it's being an outdated proprietary protocol, the vulnerabilities are never going to completely go away. And it's a, it's a story that changes from year to year and month to month. In past years, I think NTLM was a lot more interesting um, as far as NTLM attacks. Right now, for a moderately up-to-date Active Directory domain network, your biggest risk are what are called NTLM relay attacks, which we'll talk about when we get uh, briefly to our section on attacks. But your best course right now, just overall strategically, is to progressively identify where you have NTLM on your network and reduce where you're still using it. Now, how can you do that? Well, there are uh, events in the security log that allow you to track uh, the use of NTLM. And then there are policies where you can progressively disable NTLM for different systems and then even create exceptions 
for uh, those applications or systems or scenarios where you just you can't get away from NTLM for the time being. Kerberos, though, is the default authentication protocol for Active Directory. Kerberos is uh, a lot newer than NTLM, and it was you know, an internet standard. It is an internet standard. It uses a ticket-based exchange between clients and servers who all trust the so-called key distribution center. In Active Directory, the KDC is your DC, your domain controller. Now, tickets contain session keys that the domain controller creates for that logon session between that client and that server. Um, but those tickets are protected ultimately by the client account's password and the server account's password, depending upon who the ticket is for. Um, and so really, the ability for both parties to open up tickets and access the session keys is based upon an encryption key that, in all cases, is derived from that party's password hash. And at the end of the day, then, Kerberos is only as good as your password, and Kerberos is only as secure as your hash is secure. Now, we'll talk more about Kerberos attacks, but here's one overall point. Defense, and you're going to find this over and over again, folks, Defense is about following best practices, account hygiene, and so-called strong passwords. If your password is easy to guess, then Kerberos, it doesn't matter how strong or how weak Kerberos is if your password is easy to guess, Darren. You know what I'm saying? But that's that's exactly right. You know, at the end of the day, you know, we have to protect our passwords because that's a well, that is the way into these things, and sometimes the only way, and sometimes a very easy way in for an attacker if you're not following good uh, good password hygiene. Now, as I said, we'll talk about some Kerberos attacks, and they're they're very interesting. They're they're a lot of fun to talk about and dive into, and they they do occur out in the real world. But to me, it's ironic that the real defense against these and many of the other attacks we talk about today is hygiene. That is protecting and limiting privileged accounts. And there's a lot of different um, aspects to that. But it comes down to account hygiene, especially privileged account hygiene. So what does the security log give you with regard to passwords? Well, first of all, it will tell you whenever a user changes their password or an admin resets their password. Those are those two first two events, 4723 and 4724. Um, the um, next thing that we get is if password policy is changed, we, we get an event for that. Um, it's, it says domain policy 4739, but that covers basically every domain level setting regarding uh, passwords. Um, what if something runs on the domain controller that accesses your password hash? This is interesting. This is a relatively new event that's been added to the Windows security log. So one program might be Azure AD Connect Sync. That would be a legitimate program that's accessing your hash. Um, that is 4782. Then there is the very voluminous account logon category in the security log. And Windows logs an event to the um, relevant domain controller whenever um, anybody tries to authenticate with any account in AD. There's one set of events for NTLM authentication, and there's a separate set of events for Kerberos, which allow you to track um, each stage in the Kerberos process. And there, there's two kinds of tickets in Kerberos, ticket granting tickets and service tickets. And you've got events specific to all of those. 
these events can be valuable for catching some of the attacks we're talking about. Uh, for instance, um, we'll talk about the golden ticket account. Uh, the, the, sorry, the golden ticket attack. One way to catch those is to create honeypot accounts and then watch for these authentication events involving those honeypot uh, accounts. Well, let's talk about attacks now. We're going to uh, give you a quick overview. And my, my goal here is obviously in a uh, in one webinar, you know, we could spend a webinar on every single one of these attacks. And we have, in fact, if you go to my webinar library. What I want to impart in the, in the time we have today is for you to understand the prerequisites and the efficacy of the attack and you know the bottom line of what it comes down to in terms of risk and what the mitigations are. So first of all, let's talk about cracking. Now, um, password hash cracking for Windows used to be something that was really fun and um, there, there was a big story associated with it and there was uh, a lot of risk and uh, a lot of applicability. But Darren, since, since the 90s and the aughts, um, password hash cracking has become a progressively more boring story, at least in my opinion. But here's what it comes down to. Go ahead, Darren. Well, yeah, as I say, yes, yes and no. I mean, certainly, you know, maybe not with AD specifically, but when data breaches happen, Hashes are normally what gets breached when it comes to passwords, you know, and I'm not even talking about the directory at this point. We're talking a data breach from some other web application, some other system. Attackers are getting hashes as part of a bundle, and then they are cracking them. So in that in that sense, it is relevant, and we'll talk about that. But uh, in terms of where you're going here, yeah, I agree, not so much. Yeah. Um... You know, what it comes down to is we have to get a password hash. And we've talked about all the different ways, all the different places where that is can be found um, in Windows. Um, thankfully, it, the, the prerequisites are very high to get a copy of all the password hashes. The prerequisites are not as high in order to get individual password hashes that are um, sitting out there as vestiges on systems where somebody has logged on to in the past. But once we get that hash, the way we crack it is we repeatedly take candidate passwords, run them through the same hash algorithm, and then compare the hashes. If it matches, then we know we have we, we, we have a clear text password that yields that same hash. Whether it's the same password or not doesn't matter so much, um, but uh, it likely is the actual clear text password. And now we can use that, of course, in logon attacks. Um, there have been efforts to create massively huge files called rainbow tables where the computation is done one time and then the resultant hash of all these candidate passwords is stored and then you can um, you know use efficient uh, b-tree like operations to compare a captured hash to your list of pre-computed hashes in the rainbow table but as microsoft has progressively made uh, the hashing algorithm stronger, then the rainbow table keeps getting larger and larger and less, um, less likely that you have the computing time to produce it in the first place, let alone the storage to keep it around. Now, the reason there's been so much talk and there's so much history and, uh, you know, genetic memory about uh, hashing and Windows is it used to be a lot easier because for backward compatibility with that very old land manager technology Microsoft stored not just the NT hash but it 
it stored one that was far, far worse in its, uh, in its strength, and that was called the LM hash. And I won't even get into all the details of why it was so pathetically weak, but um, that's what made it so easy at the very beginning to crack passwords. Cracking modern NT hashes requires a lot more work. However, weak passwords are still a thing. And you know, any authentication protocol or hashing algorithm is only, you know, is limited when you uh, reuse passwords or use very weak passwords or known passwords. Those are three different categories. And um, some people will argue about if such a thing as strong passwords exist or not. And, you know, there's definitely the guidance from the NAIST now that uh, to some degree, you know, there's an argument that brings that into question. But one thing that nobody argues about is a known password and reuse of passwords is a big risk. And there's nothing in any of this technology that we're talking about today that really protects you against that. Darren, agreed? 100%, yep. And so that's why, to me, the most interesting part of all of these attacks, the most interesting stories, are those about password spraying and uh, um, credential stuffing. We'll get to those in just a few minutes. Now, um, a smaller story today uh, than about password cracking is something really interesting, and that is Kerber roasting. We're going to get to Kerber roasting in a second because technically that is a Kerberos specific attack, but it involves on the back end uh, to get the ultimate goods, it requires password cracking. And so that's going to be an interesting discussion. To me, I think one of the important points here, especially in the Windows NT Active Directory world, um, is that most often, if an attacker gets a hash, they're just going to use the hash. They're not going to bother cracking it back to the clear text. Now let's talk about NTLM relay attacks. So now we're talking about the NTLM authentication protocol, the challenge response that takes place between the client and the server. And um, there used to be attacks where if you just captured the NTLM packets, this used to be such a fun thing to demonstrate and wow people with. Um, you would put your NIC into promiscuous mode, you would capture the NTLM packets, feed that into uh, an old program called Loftcrack, and crack those packets, the challenge response, back to the original clear text password. That's been band-aided out more or less by Microsoft. The um, open wounds nowadays on the NTLM authentication protocol are fairly limited to relay attacks. And this is where we trick a client into trying to access, trying to log on to a quote unquote Windows server over the network. And it, this, looks, this looks like or is a Windows server that's a member of a domain. Now it's not hard to get um, a user account where you've gained initial access and uh, MITRE attack execution. If you've gained those things, on a uh, user's endpoint, then it's very easy to uh, run something in the background that attempts to log on to this imposter system elsewhere on the network. And that Windows workstation, that endpoint, will graciously attempt to log on to it and participate as the client party in a challenge response exchange. What the imposter server does, though, is acting more or less as a man in the middle, it grabs the response generated by the client and then uses that to turn around and access the, uh, the Windows network using um, that user's credentials. The, uh, uh, the way it works is 
we have to trick the Windows system into trying to log on, initiate a log on to this imposter Windows uh, server on the network. The client uh, sends that, the um, imposter server turns around and sends that request to the domain controller. The domain controller generates a challenge which is then relayed back to the client. The client encrypts that challenge with essentially a hash of the user's password and then sends that back. So that challenge is an encrypted copy, sorry, that response is an encrypted copy of the challenge. Now the cool thing is the bad guy has that uh, response and can now use it against Active Directory to gain access under that user's uh, credentials. So the, the key prerequisites are we have to have a presence on the domain network where we can be that imposter, and we have to trick endpoints on that network to try to log on to us. The solution, I think the solution is largely to progressively identify where you have NTLM and migrate to Kerberos. Let's talk about pass the hash. So you only need the clear text password if you're in, in the Windows world in order to log on interactively at the keyboard and screen of a Windows system. If you just want to access it over the network, which is usually more than adequate for a bad guy's needs, then all you need is the hash. So getting hashes from domain controllers should be pretty difficult. And um, it, 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 you know, if you're doing your job at all, it should be very difficult. And here's the thing. If a bad guy is still able to get those password hashes, then to me, you've already lost the battle because they should never get to the point where they can access NTS ntds.dit. But remember, you can still find hashes in other places. And the one that has gained the most attention of attackers is the memory of workstations where someone has logged on. And here is one of the worst case scenarios. Um, you have some end user endpoint workstation out there where you have a user who's not security conscious who is you know, always accessing the internet and doing all the things that a user normally does during the course of their work, interacting with the outside world and interacting with the internet for their own personal um, uh, you know, purposes. But that same workstation at some point in the past, someone with more authority, whether it's a domain admin or, or not, but somebody with greater level of access has logged on to that system and a residual hash from that logon session uh, remains in memory or in the cache credentials of that system. But let, let's focus on the hash in memory since we're talking about past the hash. Well now if after that after the fact of that admin logging on or potentially in the future if that endpoint is compromised if the end user of that endpoint has local admin authority to their workstation, which is extremely common, then we can we the bad guy can be running something like Mimi Cats and we can harvest the credential artifacts from past logons or we can wait around for someone else to come and log on. Maybe they don't have more authority, but they have different authority. And this all comes down to, in MITRE ATT&CK, lateral movement or privilege elevation. Mitigations for pass the hash. Number one, practice account and system hygiene. Especially, do not allow lower tier users to ever log on to higher tier systems. So lower tier, like tier zero, those are more secure than higher tier systems. So we, we need to know which accounts are tier zero, tier one, tier two, whatever tiers we have, and which systems. Systems need to be designated likewise. And the rule is 
a lower tier account never logs on to a higher tier system. Now, that doesn't completely prevent pass the hash. It doesn't completely prevent lateral movement, uh, such as uh, from one account to another account within the same tier. But at least it uh, helps prevent uh, privilege elevation attacks. The other things that can mitigate pass the hash is changing a password, because now it renders that old hash uh, useless, even if it is sitting out there somewhere. And rebooting systems gets rid at least of those hashes stored in memory in the LSASS process. Uh, golden ticket is fascinating, but listen, at the end of the day, before you can do golden ticket, you have to have the password to KRB TGT. That's the foundation for the whole Kerberos encryption of the, of the domain. That's the foundation for all the security in Active Directory. So you've already lost the battle. Um, it, this is really a story about DC hygiene and privileged access. Um, yes, there, there is monitoring that you can do, and you should do it, but don't allow it in the first place. Curb roasting. Now, this one is interesting. If you have uh, user accounts that you have services running as, Windows background services running as user accounts, then uh, you do need to think about Kerber roasting. This is where, this is because any user in your domain can ask for a service ticket to any service in the domain, and the domain controller will issue that ticket. Now, it doesn't mean they can use that ticket to log on, because they can only you, they can only get the session key that makes that service ticket useful if um, they are really who they say they are. But we can ask for that ticket and then <clears throat> um, we can start attacking how that ticket is encrypted because ultimately the encryption of that service ticket um, is based upon that service account's password hash. And that is potentially crackable. So even after you've accomplished Kerber roasting, it's only ultimately valuable if you can crack that, uh, that ticket back to the user's original uh, password hash. Mitigations, well, don't run services with user accounts. Instead, use group managed service accounts. Also, if you do have service accounts, then use passwords that are going to take a lot of computing power to crack. Then you've got imposter domain controllers, but again, the big prerequisite here is you have to have domain admin authority in the first place. So uh, manage that. This, again, account hygiene. I want to finish up by talking about what I consider to be probably the attacks you really should think about the most, and that is better than brute force attacks. We're talking about password spraying and credential stuffing. And here, to me, are really the dynamics here. It's which passwords are selected. You know, why are these so much more effective than brute force password guessing attacks? It's because of the passwords we're selecting, the lockout policy rate that we're allowed, and the password policy at the organization. Um, how do these work? Well, with password spraying, we, the bad guy, take a small number of widely used passwords, and then we try them against a large number of accounts. Now, it's relatively, it's easy in an Active Directory environment to get a list of all the user accounts. So getting a large number of accounts in Active Directory is easy. Now it's a matter of taking a small number of widely used passwords and plinking away at all those accounts one password at a time. We stay beneath the radar because you don't see an exorbitant number of attacks on any one account. And there's no lockout to worry about on non-existent usernames. So we can use this against guest usernames or well-known usernames or 
discovered usernames, password spraying. Now there's something I call targeted password spraying. That's where you crawl like the website of the organization you're attacking to come up with words that are arcane to that organization and may very well be um, used by users picking out passwords. Then there's credential stuffing. And here is the key fact that we, the attacker, are exploiting with credential stuffing. Users reuse passwords across systems. They, use, they reuse passwords across their consumer slash personal life and their business professional life. They reuse passwords all over the place. And password lists get stolen all the time from sites that have nothing to do with you and the network you're trying to uh, protect, but because users reuse their own passwords and across many humans, they tend to oftentimes pick the same password, we are able to uh, exploit that. So you have a password list, now what? Well, you can use it in a more aggressive spraying context, or you can use it against the right username. So we are able to hack, I don't know, social media company X, and uh, we see a username randy.smith. So now we go to uh, Acme, where Randy works, and we try that same password. What if that password doesn't match the organization's password policy? It's still valuable to us, because we can mangle it. We can add digits onto the end, or an exclamation point, or we can change E's to threes, things like that. And there are bad guy tools that do all of this and more, and do it very, very efficiently. So protection against these better than brute force attacks comes down to password policy. The bad news is there's not a lot of password policy available to you in Active Directory out of the box. That's something Darren may talk about. Your lockout policy can help throttle the pace of these attacks. Monitoring can be useful. Education, trying to get users to change their behavior, pick stronger passwords. But what it really comes down to is proactive detection and remediation. Finding accounts with known passwords. Finding accounts that are commonly used on that, that use passwords that appear on compromised lists and getting those passwords changed. And really, Darren, that's where you come in, eh? Exactly, yes. So, um, yes, yeah, so we'll transition in here and let me get my screen shared out. And really just to transition right into, um, just quick check that the screen share is working properly here. Let me know if it's not, Randy. Um, You're looking good. Really, thank you. Uh, great. So really, you know, think about why these password attacks are so successful. And Randy, you already hinted at it, but here's some, some stats that will kind of back that up. Um, users absolutely are reusing passwords. Um, so if an attacker finds a password out in the wild, um, if nearly two-thirds of the users are reusing passwords, what are the odds that that password that that attacker got is used somewhere else? It's pretty high. Um, users are also going to follow pretty predictable patterns when changing their passwords. Um, you know, we know this, you know, as end users, we're probably all guilty of it at one point or another, just putting a different number or a different special character at the end of the same password that we're already used to. Um, you know, you're cycling your passwords, that can mitigate some of those Kerberos attacks that Randy discussed, but if you're cycling passwords in a predictable way, attackers are going are gonna to know that too, and they can be pretty fast on your tail to, to figure out what you did and, and proceed with their, with their lateral movement around your network. Um, common base words and passwords are there, um, so we'll talk about that in a bit, um, and really, yeah, this one's this last bullet's about home networks, but it extends to work too. As the users, the end user population in general is relatively uneducated on 
what makes for a good password? What makes for good security hygiene? Um, you know, that, hit, that can hit us in all sorts of different ways and, you know, not, you know, including if anyone read about what happened to the city of Dallas yesterday with a callback social engineering attack and all those things can happen, right? And we don't really know what kind of movements those attackers did yet, but, um, you know, certainly if your passwords are weak, if we can exploit those somehow as a, as a bad actor, that's something you want to um, proactively address just to reduce the uh, the ability for an attacker to move around your network once they can exploit something like that. Um, just kind of quick uh, rehash, if you will, apologies for the pun, but um, you know, what are the attackers doing with passwords? And Randy, you touched on it, but just to kind of reiterate, um, attackers, if they're trying to guess passwords, if they're trying to crack password lists, if they get them, um, if they get a password for a service account for one of those other exploits, then they have to crack it for nefarious reasons. They're going to use some of these common or easily guessed base words. They're going to use common default credentials, um, password, admin, and you know, some of this you know, welcome, some of the things like that. Um, they're going to use existing breach password lists and spec ops. We do quite a bit to help you mitigate that in your network so that we can be sure that the passwords your users are setting are not something that match a breach password list because we know the attackers are trying that. Um, and of course, if they're not trying these, you know, these uh, these passwords directly through a login form or something, if they have hashes, they are still trying to crack them. If they got a, a SHA-1 breach or uh, an MD5 hash list, they're trying to reverse those um, using all of the above to figure out what those initial passwords were. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the idea of honeypots, uh, and we'll get into how Spec Ops leverages honeypots as it comes to uh, bolstering our and then your uh, password security. Uh, Randy mentioned a, a honeypot account earlier, which is a great mechanism uh, for monitoring nefarious activity in your network. Essentially, what a honeypot account is, is you stand up a user account, looks like a normal user, it is not associated with a normal user, might be made to look like a high privilege account, maybe you put a description in that says it's an admin account or something, and you watch for someone trying to attack that account. That's, that's one idea of a honeypot. Um, we use them a little bit differently. We have honeypot servers scattered around the internet, and we use them to monitor for and gather live password attack data. Um, so we've got you know, a number of these server, ser servers scattered around the web, uh, I couldn't really say, of course, where they are, how many of them there are, and they move them around from time to time, but they're stood up as intentionally insecure looking servers. There's nothing there behind the scenes, but we stand something up that looks like an SSH server that's just open to the internet, or a remote desktop server that's open to the internet. Uh, and it's really interesting because we don't do it a whole lot, if anything, to promote these, and yet we see login traffic on them. We see north of 200,000 login attempts per day on these servers that are of random IPs that have no DNS records pointing to them, that have no links from other systems pointing to them, and yet attackers are even finding those and trying to log in. Uh, because the, what's behind that login form is nothing but a service that we built to collect the credentials being entered by these attackers, we can see the kind of credentials that are being used in these password spray credential stuffing attacks against those honeypots. Uh, we see a lot, a lot of data that corresponds with Randy mentioned earlier. We see admin and root and password in all of these passwords. Your common keyboard walks, so the QAZ, WSX, just those diagonal lines down your keyboard, ASDF, QWERTY. A, B, C, D, welcome, temp, all these common base words. The attackers are trying them. And you think about it, they're not trying these things because they're not successful on real systems, if you want to think about it that way. Um, we're also seeing high rate of existing breach passwords. So when we see these passwords, we can compare them against our known database of breach passwords. And there's a lot of overlap. So when we see attackers using these passwords, we see a lot of relatively short passwords. And these days when I say relatively short passwords, I'll be 12 characters or less. Um, you know, we used to think an 8-character password was great, then a 10, then a 12. Um, now when I set a password, if it's short of the 20 characters, it's because the system won't let me go longer than that. It's, um, but the end users, 
the way they've been taught to, to enter passwords, the way they're required to enter passwords, even by NIST and PCI, some of those requirements. 12 characters can be enough. The attackers know that. They continue to try to exploit that. Um, now, every once in a while on these honeypots, it's a small number, but every once in a while, we'll see a credential we've never seen before. And that's what gets really interesting about our offering, because we can feed that data back into our breach password protection offering. Um, it's a password that was entered by attacker, doesn't match any known data breaches, known data breaches being the key there. Um, you have to kind of wonder, why did an attacker enter that credential? It's a, it's a relatively long, maybe 12 characters, maybe a you know, very random looking password. The attacker's trying that because they found it somewhere, odds are. So we feed that into our breach password protection offering. Now, what is Stackhouse Brief Pass Protection overall? It it started out as very, you know, very much a similar approach to how they've been pwned, and it's, it continues to operate in that way as well. So we start with all of the public data breaches we can possibly get our hands on. You have been pwned, you've heard of collection lists, you scour the dark web for all of these breaches. Every time you hear about a breach in the press, we hear about it too, if we haven't already. It's fed into our list, and we've use all that data to curate a list of north of 3 billion unique passwords that have appeared in data breaches. And we're updating that constantly, either through the backflow from the honeypot data from those new matches, from new breaches that come out. Wherever we can find this information, it is fed back into the breach password protection database. Um, something else to think about. Now, now, now we can, you know, Going into really how we analyze some of the things we found analyzing the data. We look at the whole list, those 3 billion passwords. Um, and this is really a callback to some of the things Randy talked about earlier without the directory password policy, knowing that the honeypots are being attacked by relatively short passwords. Um, this compliance standards that are out there aren't going to cut it when it comes to blocking password reuse because the vast majority of the passwords in the database are compliant with these standards. You know, in PCI, you implement a PCI standard, you're four out of four, and the length requirement and all that. Fifty-nine percent of those passwords, for example, are you know are you know that breach passwords are technically compatible with PCI. Uh, NIST is actually even worse. NIST only recommends eight characters still, so the number gets a bit higher. Um, so it's really interesting to see. Um, like Randy mentioned earlier, there's no real industry standard for password policy, and the data kind of shows that the standards that are out there aren't quite sufficient if you want to block credential stuffing passwords for any type of tax. Um, the common base works theory, and I'd be remiss if I didn't note today is May the 4th. For, uh, for, for anyone on the call who is familiar, it's for quite a few of you, it is Star Wars Day. May the 4th be with you. So this is an example that we thought was sort of apropos, you know, what are the common base words in passwords? Star Wars franchise has been around since the 70s. It is immensely popular. And, of course, the end users are using character names from that franchise in, in their passwords. It's kind of amazing the high number we see. Um, it's not just limited to things like that, though. We've done other analyses. You'll see these come out from spec ops from time to time. At opening day a couple years ago for Major League Baseball, we just took a look and said, okay, what teams are showing up in passwords? I think the Cincinnati Reds were number one, but, you know, the color red, who knows? But, you know, those kinds of things show up. Um, Marvel or DC or, you know, comic book characters, movie characters. Um, we've done an analysis of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, and this is where you really want to start thinking about base words relative to your environment showing up in passwords. Um, they may not be in public data breaches, but if I'm attacking a 400, Fortune 500 company as a bad actor, if I'm trying to figure out what password you used in one of those environments, I'm going to use that company's name as a base word for the kinds of passwords I try. I'm going to use their location names, their product names, key terms about their industry, because you can kind of call back to the end user behavior. End user sits at the desk. We ask them to, you know, to think of a password. They look around the room for some hints, and something about the company they're working for is likely to end up in their password somewhere if you don't prevent them from doing so. Um, so now we'll talk a little bit about 
what spec ops can offer here in terms of helping you um, this, mitigate this problem. Um, the first tool that we'll talk about, and we'll do a full demo in a few minutes here, but just to call out what this is, if you're not familiar already, we have a tool called Spec Ops Password Auditor. It is a free tool. Um, you can fill out a form on our website and download it, and we'll tell you where to go at the end of the webinar here to, to get that. But we can run by you, by, well, we, you can run as a domain admin this tool, and it will be able to, because you're in a domain admin, inspect all of the live NT hashes in your environment. And we can compare those hashes against the hashes for the passwords in our database and bring you back a report showing you all of the users that are using a password that SpecOps knows about. Um, you can export administrative reports. You can see all sorts of other interesting information, including if you, if you have a blank hash with a hash of nothing, which is a specific NT hash for a blank password. If you have users reusing passwords amongst themselves and things like that, we can find this as well. But this will give you an idea of what password reuse looks in, like in your environment and what users would be immediately vulnerable to a, to a password attack based on a known password from a known data breach. Um, that extends into SpecOps password policy. Um, this is the password filter product that Randy mentioned earlier. This is a tool that plugs into your Active Directory as a password filter. We can help you enforce those compliance requirements. We can help you block the reuse of passwords from that breach password protection list. We can block the use of common base words, you know, words, you know, the words you specify. We can give you some hints there as well. But um, this is going to help enforce some of those rules. So the end users, like you said, they probably don't know better. We have to stop them from doing these things in the first place. And password policy is designed to do that. Uh, and we'll also help them understand the rules, understand the requirements as they're setting the, those, those passwords, which is important as well. So with that, we'll do a, a quick transition here and we'll show you live what some of this uh, technology looks like in action. Uh, so first here, this, this is the password auditor live in real time. Um, like I said, you can run this as an administrative account in your environment, it runs off of that breach password list. Here it is. There's every user in this environment. This one, of course, is you know, relatively insecure intentionally. It is, it is a demo environment, of course. But you're going to find, uh, almost guaranteed, a decent amount of users using breach passwords in your environment. We don't collect stats on this. There's no call home or reporting or anything like that for us to see. But from what our, our customers, what our clients have told us, it's not unusual to find 20, 25, 30% of the user accounts in the environment using one of these breach passwords. Um, you know, whether it's end user accounts or service accounts or both, um, you can highlight some of this, um, some of these really easy targets in your environment so at least you know the issue is out there. But we don't want to stop there. We, of course, want to help you enforce um, the rules to keep this um, to keep those passwords from getting set in the first place. So we can configure, this is the password policy configuration, and so we can do things. Breach password protection is real easy. Turn it on. Um, we can even go back and check your existing passwords daily if you like. Um, but all of this is an enforcement engine of that same list auditors running off of. Uh, if you want to think about this common base words, the custom dictionaries are here as well. So. Um, you know, I start if I'm working in Spec Ops. Um, you know, I've got a location name, some keywords about our industry in here. Um, so as someone working with Spec Ops, part of the Atlas 24 group, which is why I see some of these other terms in here, I want my own users in my environment to keep these kinds of terms out of their passwords, and this is going to enforce that. Um, and of course, the Star Wars list we saw from the earlier slide, um, the keyboard combos list I have here, which has those ASDFs and QWERTYs kinds of lists in here. Um, build these lists out as many as you like. Um, we'll do a case insensitive search. We'll check for leak speak substitutions. So ats for a's, zeros for o's. Those don't count. It's still a dictionary word. We're still going to find it and keep it out of the passwords. Um, now what does that look like from end user, end user perspective? Because a lot of this is not going to work very well if we don't tell the end users what's going on. Uh, yes, we can enforce the rules. We'll do that behind the scenes in Active Directory, regardless of what you do from an end user perspective. Um, but if you don't want the users to 
keep doing the bad things they're doing, if you want them to understand good password hygiene, if you want to educate them, if you want to have them extend those behaviors to other passwords that are not controlled by Active Directory, we give you some tools to really show the user what it is they need to do to pick a strong password. So this is a Windows client that does this for us. We also have this as a web-based interface as part of our self-service password reset solution. Uh, but we can show the user as they're typing, what are the rules in the policy? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Now, I can't check everything as we're typing. I'm not going to check the dictionary list, the breach list, or the password history as I'm typing. But if that's my favorite Star Wars character, that's great. I can't do that. And my IT department's one step ahead of me there. I'm going to do a breach password instead. Maybe it's not something like that. Maybe it's truly a password that I've reused from somewhere else. Or there's some other way. An attacker's already seen that password. Spec Ops has already seen that password. Yikes. Now I've just, not only have I blocked that password from being set in Active Directory as a reused password, I told the end user that's a breach password. That opens up all sorts of possibilities from an end user perspective uh, because now we're educating the end users about password hygiene, about, well, yikes, I've used that password for years. Somebody knows about it. Maybe I shouldn't use that password anymore. It gets the end users better educated to follow some better password hygiene with everything they do. But most importantly, we've kept that password out of your Active Directory environment. Um, there's all sorts of other things we can do with this tool beyond uh, the, the, the dictionaries list, just some quick highlights. Um, the character group requirements are customizable if you're PCI, if you want to go no character requirements, if you go full NIST style, that's fine. Um, Length-based aging policies are really, really cool because um, as, long, again, as long as you're not subject to a compliance requirement that says password change every 90 days, um, we can start to guide users to pick longer and longer passwords. If we know the attackers are trying passwords 12 characters or less, well, let's start setting passwords 12 characters or more in our environment. But we can go beyond that. We can say to the end user, you know, if you go up to 15 or 16 characters, we'll reward that. We'll say your password can last longer. We're going to leave you alone about the next force password change for a lot longer in exchange for you using that stronger password. It's a great way to encourage your end users to follow better password practices. Uh, we can tell the users when the password is about to expire and tell them about uh, what the password policy is before they change their password. Again, an education and user experience. So all of your users, every time a password change comes up, we're helping you tell them exactly what makes for a strong password so they're not vulnerable to some of these password-based attacks. And of course, lots and lots of other requirements uh, that we could specify, custom ones if you need to. Uh, it's an incredibly flexible tool. It is based on a group policy engine under the hood, so you don't even need to do one-size-fits-all. We can have different policies for different sets of users. I can enforce 12 characters up for my end users, I could enforce 120 characters and up for my service accounts, um, and probably somewhere in between for my admin accounts. We can do as many different password policies as you need uh, to balance the usability, the security um, of all of the user accounts in your environment relative to the, the level of privilege they may have. Uh, just to finally wrap it up, just a quick summary of some of the features we've talked about here. Um, of course, all this and more, like I said. Uh, and don't forget this end user real-time feedback. We didn't talk about it much earlier in the demo. It's all about you know, password storage and password attacks. And it's great to understand all that. It's really important to understand all of that. At the end of the day, the solution is going to be educating your users, helping them pick a stronger password, guiding them away from that, uh, that poor password hygiene that leaves you vulnerable to those sorts of attacks. Um, of course, if you'd like to learn more, please visit our website. There's a URL up here on the screen. You can visit that. You can learn all about the password policy product, and then from there you can, of course, uh, fill out a form to contact us if you'd like to see um, 
see some more information on that. Darren, we've got some questions for you when you're ready. Let's go for it. Um, Paul would like to know, does the password tool need to run against each password list, or does it run once again all of, sorry, or does it run once against all of the password lists uh, or files in one run? It's, um, so the list that, that we give you to download is already, um, all the lists are, you know, all the data is compressed into that, optimized for, for faster scanning and all that. So um, you just tell us which OUs you want us to scan, uh, and we'll uh, check the, uh, the users in those OUs against all of the passwords in the list. All right. And by the way, Darren, um, make sure you have a look at the question window. There's a few towards the bottom that I'm not sure if they're applicable or not. So um, I think you'll see the ones I'm asking about. But Justin would like to know, can you prevent a user from using the same password across multiple forests? Have I still got you there, Darren? Uh, I was just trying to figure out if that was me or you. I think uh, I lost you for a second. I'm not sure if that was on my end or yours. Okay. Here, here's the question again. Can you prevent a user from using the same password across multiple forests? Um, we can't prevent that. We can detect it. So Password Runner does have a report showing um, password, re password reuse across accounts. Um, Prevention's a little bit of a tricky, uh, a tricky problem to solve because um, one, you've got to figure out how to securely track the passwords across multiple forests in real time, and there's some implications there. And let's say you do find a hit, you don't necessarily want to tell the end user that they've successfully entered another user's password either. So. Um, Certainly from a reporting standpoint, you can audit for it, but it's not something that we currently enforce because uh, at the end of the day, the risks seem to outweigh the benefits of doing so there. Okay, gotcha. Question, though. Yeah. Um, let's see. Prakash asks, um, what kind of traffic does this tool have to any of the cloud servers of Spec Ops? Um, the only connection to the cloud is going to be to download the local copy of the list. Um, and you can even do that through a little offline manual process if, if you have an air gap network. But uh, once we have that list, you can disconnect from the internet. There is no callback uh, when you're running that password auditor tool. Gotcha. Um, so, Spencer, I'm not sure I answer ask your question. I think it's just asking about um, a demo. Can you get um, user, can, can you schedule demos with, um, with potential uh, customers? Oh, absolutely. That's the, the forms on our, the contact form on our website will connect you with someone who can help schedule a demo. Absolutely. Um, Anna asks, is there any enforcement for passphrases? Yes, there is a passphrase engine in there. There's a couple of different ways you can do that. Um, let me bring the demo environment back up here. So you do see there is a passphrase option, and this kind of creates a dual password policy where you can say, here's my base traditional password model. If you want to go 25, 30 characters or more, we can have a less restrictive policy. So you can do that. Uh, what I see a lot of orgs doing, though, is just talking about all passwords as passphrases. So across the board, we'll say, and this is something you can't do with Active Directory necessarily, is to say, let's turn off character groups, maybe just require a special character, maybe something like that happens. Um, but we can, we can decouple that from keeping usernames out of passwords, keeping common base words out of passwords. But you know what? Everybody's password is going to be 20 characters in it. And we'll teach the end users how to do that. We'll teach them. Um, NCSC is big on this, but a lot of orgs you know, globally are doing this. The idea of three random words, three or four random words. Um, the old X XKCD comment about the, um, the horse and the battery. I forget the other words. But, you know, three or four random words, maybe a special character thrown in for good measure. It's a great way to think about setting your password that way because it is going to create something that is 
that is quite long, and as long as you keep the, the reused debris passers out of there, and there are passphrase length ones in that list as well, um, as long as you keep those common base words out of passwords, uh, the passphrase model is a great, great way to, to get your users to, to choose passwords. They're going to be very difficult for an attacker to, uh, to figure out. Um, we've got plenty more good, really good questions. Thank you, everybody. Keep them coming. Ray would like to know, um, where is the software installed? On the domain controller? The password filter um, does go on the domain controller. Um, that's a Microsoft requirement. That's you have to, yeah, yeah. yeah. You have, yeah, essentially the password filter architecture and that, that other webinar that Randy and I did a while back goes into this in more detail, but uh, the password filter uh, is a hook into LSAS locally on the domain controller. Uh, it is a DLL that is loaded into memory by LSAS, by Active Directory, when you start up. So it must live locally. Um, the configuration also lives in SysVault on your DCs between the list and the group policies. Everything is local. Um, the administration, the password auditor, you can run those on any other machine in the domain. Um, Charles asks, how does the product audit passwords that are already set, for example, service accounts that may have been set to non-expiring for a very long time and don't go through a regular change process? That's a really good question as well. It all comes back to that NT hash that we talked about earlier, that Randy, that you talked about earlier primarily. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also, it, it's not ideal from a security perspective, but it's something that works to our advantage here. Uh, like you mentioned, those hashes are not salted. So what that means is for any given password, uh, when you compute the NT hash of that password, it is going to be the exact same hash for every user in every Active Directory system. So if my password is password1, that computes an NT hash, that hash is going to be the same anywhere password1 has been set as a password. Uh, the auditor works off of that. We compare the NT hashes to each other, and that's how we're able to determine what up necessarily knowing the password, we've forgotten what the plain text is at this point, but we see a hash we recognize, that guarantees it's a, it's a password that's been uh, discovered and added to our breach list. Uh, let's see here. Jason says, can SpecOps coexist with other apps that have their agents that run on DCs and also leverage hooks into LSASS? Yes, absolutely. You've got a... Uh, a password notification package that does synchronization to some other identity system. Yeah, absolutely. We've actually got our own um, password synchronization tool that pairs into that, but any others out there, um, there is no problem with running those in tandem with ours. We see all sorts of um, solutions like that out there. Um, Active Directory handles it really well, essentially. Um, during a password change, um, and this is again getting into something we talked about last time, Randy, but um, and after directory, um, when a password change comes through, um, AD will call all of the password filters registered in LSAS before the password is changed. That's where we get to inspect that password for uh, the common base words and all the other things we're checking. Um, once the password gets set, there's another round of queries, and that's what's called password notification. At that point, essentially, AD will tell all of the filters installed, this user just set that password. So your password synchronization, password notification solutions will continue to get that notification from AD just as they do um, as they do today. Installing our product has no effect on that. Okay. Um, next. So Warner says, in order to turn off complexity and then just require a single special character and 20 length, for instance, he says, I'm assuming you would need to tweak Active Directory policy and turn off their complexity requirement? Yes. Um, another really, really good question. Um, so, yes. So, in order to um, to make the SpecOps policy compatible with AD, we have to bypass the complexity in AD, which we don't, you know, just installing a password filter does not bypass the AD policy, so we have to um, either turn off complexity in the AD default domain policy. Um, that's the easiest approach. Uh, we can also um, leverage fine-grained password policies to do that. So sometimes we'll do an implementation where um, the SpecOps password policy and an AD fine-grained policy are applied to the same user group. 
the fine grain policy removes the AD complexity, and then our policy um, adds back on the uh, the desired level of complexity that you want here. Okay, and um, Anna, are there any smart rules to detect where passwords are being used? For instance, application support or scheduled tasks. That's not that would be an area. Hard. That, yeah, that's that's not yeah. something that Spec Ops gets into. Um, you know, I would say certainly, um, you know, going back to maybe um, Randy, your slide around the you know, audit, you know, your Active Directory auditing and what That's machines, right. login attempts are coming from, um, things like that. And it's, it's a lot of detective work, uh, for sure. Um, but uh, our focus is really around when the password is, you know, what the password is being set to in, in Active Directory. Um, excellent. And that's, that's very true. The security log would be the key there. Um, so Brand says, with the product installed on domain controllers, does it require domain admin authority or high, highly privileged access rights to manage the product via the portal? So this is a access management question about the application. Yeah, that's another really good question. So um, the installation is going to require admin rights on your domain controllers. You know, we're hooking into LSAS. You would hope that that's a restriction. Um, but you can uh, for, uh, delegate the ongoing management to another set of users. So we have a built-in security group here. You see the Spec Ops Password Policy Admins group. We can help, you know, the software will create that for you and delegate to that group all of the uh, access to all of the areas in AD that need to be managed for this product. Um, and then um, you can slip in those lower privilege admins to manage this product rather than constantly running as a domain admin. So if you want to follow a least privilege model, if you want to delegate manager this to your IT security team or some other group that doesn't have domain admin, uh, the functionality is built in to do that. Great. Um, here's a great one. Will says, can passwords be changed by remote users? Installing this product doesn't for that. change. Yeah, yeah. So, well, for pa a password policy product isn't going to change anything about how you're currently interfacing with your domain controllers. Um, so, any any point that you can change your passwords at today will continue to work with this product install. Of course, the enforcement behind the scenes changes, but uh, let's say you have a web portal where you're doing password changes or password authentication, um, or a VPN client maybe that's doing that. Um, there's no change in what the domain controller looks like from the outside looking in. So all of those applications are going to work exactly the same way. Um, we do, of course, um, offer our own um, web-based solution for remote password changes. Um, our self-service password reset solution uh, partners, UReset, um, can also help you there as well. So if you have remote users that need a web-based interface to change their passwords or reset when they forget it. Um, if you have remote workstations um, that are joined to AD where you need a way to reset the passwords and the local credential cache on those machines when they're off network, um, Spec Ops self-service password reset can absolutely help you out there as well. Awesome. Um, Let's see, do you happen to know if Spec Ops is compatible with Okta authentication? Oh yeah, we, uh, we, uh, we actually integrate Okta Verify into our self-service password reset solution. So um, we work with quite a number of uh, shared customers with Okta, no concerns at all there. Awesome. Um, uh, let's see, I think you'll like this question. How would you compare your product with Azure AD password protection? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so the, really the key difference between us and Azure AD, um, there are many, but the key difference is um, what we've talked about, the, uh, the breach password protection, um, even the custom dictionary words. Um, Microsoft takes a very laid-back approach to that. Um, if you look at the documentation for Azure breach password protection, um, they will describe what they call their global list of passwords. And they will say specifically that the aim of that list is not to block reuse of passwords from public data breaches. They've got some easily guessed things in there, like the word password and things like that, but they're making no attempt to block reuse of the passwords from these public data breaches. Um, even as it comes to custom dictionary words, they have a scoring algorithm where 
Um, you can populate the Azure custom list, but it is not an across-the-board blanket ban on those custom words. Um, users can still use a breach, uh, use a common base word in tandem with a few other random characters, um, and Azure will accept that. Um, so if your goals are to block reuse of breach passwords, to 100% block the use of common base words, custom dictionary words, um, SpecOps will uh, will do everything that Active Directory or Azure AD does not do there. Um, man, you're going to love this comment from Spencer. Thank you for sharing this, Spencer. He says, speaking from experience, having Azure Active Directory password protection on, still daily breached passwords are found by SpecOps using uh, their uh, password auditor. Hope to deploy the deploy the paid spec up solution soon. Yeah. Oh, that was a question or a statement, but uh, sounds good. Yeah. No, no, it's it, no, no, it's a, it's a <laughs> statement, but uh, I thought we should share it. Um, wonderful, wonderful. Let's Glad see to hear. Here. It. While we're on the subject of this of Azure AD, let's just ask a couple other questions that came out right away. Satya asks, "Is it possible to use this tool?" against Azure AD to identify weak passwords? That we cannot do. Um, and Randy, you actually explained why in the, in the slide on Azure AD Connect. Um, we can't access the, the hashes in Azure AD the way we can in on-prem AD. It's a, it's a, it's a limitation um, of, well, probably intentionally by Microsoft. Well, it's actually, it's not possible to do that here. Uh, that kind of thing and, we're doing in Azure AD. But I think it's key to make sure we understand the hybrid scenario because if the accounts are being maintained and you know if the master if the majority of your user accounts are in your on-prem AD and that's where users are changing their passwords then um, you're 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 also protecting accounts up in Azure AD regardless of the fact that you're not seeing those hashes you follow me oh yeah no I perfectly said and uh yeah I, I sort of said so myself to, to lead off but um but yeah you know, you're you know if you're gonna if you're looking at azure ad as a solution for authentication um it's important to keep in mind when you go if you're going to go full azure ad a user that exists solely in azure that is not synced from active directory then you cannot control the password with this level of granularity you are strictly limited to what microsoft offers in their in their um Azure AD password protection to protect the password of those accounts. But if you maintain the on-prem Active Directory user, continue to synchronize them, continue to use Active Directory as the password authority, then we can do all of the things we've talked about today and continue to guarantee that your users are following good password hygiene. All right, we still got some questions here. Robert says, if you have lots of password changes and you have to remove, sorry, if you have lots of tool changes, lots of tool changes, and you have to remove the product, is there an audit log of what changes were made to unwind those things if needed in the future? So tool changes. I think it must must be talking about like installing uh, password filters and stuff like that. So if yeah. you uninstall, what happens to the password filter? Right. Okay. Install and uninstall. Yeah. Okay. Um, if I'm understanding the, cor the the question correct, I think the answer is to say that we're not making any permanent changes to your Active Directory. Um, anything that we can that we're doing for the installation and configuration of this product can be undone. There are no schema changes involved in setting up a tool like this. Um, so, um, and it's a question we get, you know, very often is, you know, let's say, you know, we buy spec ops and then a few years later we decide uh, to go in a different direction. That's fine. We, we hate to see you go, of course, but you can uninstall all of the software through the control panel. You can, you can back out all of the configurations that have been done in Active Directory and we will not leave a single trace behind. Um, Warner says, I missed on how Password Auditor would check for breached passwords. You mentioned a downloaded list, but how does it a check against each user? Is it dumping and comparing each account hash against the list? Well, it's doing that in memory, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's um uh, it's actually it's it's actually sort of leveraging that replication. Uh, that our architecture kind of attack that, that we talked about earlier, but in, of course, a legitimate way. Um, we can, as a domain admin, 
query the domain controller and basically say, hey, in memory, give us a copy of every NT hash and it'll it'll hand that information over to us. And then in memory, we do the comparison against the uh, against the list that you downloaded All right. from us. Let's let's keep rolling. Um, Willie asks, is this an annually paid for service? Yes, it is. It is um, a subscription uh, sales model. So, um, you know, one year, or we do offer multi-year agreements. Of course, um, the minimum engagement would be one year. Um, and if you're just sort of learning more about price points and you know, multi-year incentives, things like that, I'd encourage you to reach out to us, and the sales representative can give you more detail there. Um, how to? Okay, here's a great one. How does uh, two-factor authentication fit in with the solution? Um, oh, that is a really good question. How much time do I have? Uh, I'll, I'll give you the short answer. Question. We're already a bit over here. Um, you know, any multi-factor solution you have today, again, is going to continue to work the same way it does. I said earlier about um, other applications that work with Active Directory and passwords. Same thing applies to your multi-factor solutions. Implementing those products will have no effect on them. Um, multi-factor is its own. You know, kind of animal to talk about. If you are doing multi-factor, that's great. Everybody should be doing multi-factor. Um, and really, a solution like this is going to complement that. Um, multi-factor is it's not it's not a, um, a silver bullet to solve all your security woes. Even if you have multi-factor, those factors can be exploited. The password is still part of the equation. You need to keep your password strong and secure, even if you have multi-factor. Um, so, if you're yeah, if you're if, if you're on your well well on your security uh, maturity path to multi-factor, great, we can help you. Uh, it's not going to have no effects. It's only going to help your uh, your the security of your environment. Fantastic. Uh, let's see here. Dan says, "I'm sorry if I missed this, but would you be able to immediately force a password reset upon the identification of a compromised password?" Yes, um, that is built into the daily scan. We can force a password change. We can notify the end user or anybody about that forced password change, and this will run once every 24 hours. Great. Uh, let's see here. Is there any limitation on number of users in AD? Like, we have close to 300,000 users, for example. No restriction from our standpoint. Um, we are because we run in Active Directory. We are is exactly sc as scalable as your Active Directory is. Um, we don't add any significant overhead to your domain controllers with this product in play. It is on every domain controller, so the password changes are going to be spread throughout. Um, and we've certainly seen uh, we do have customers in the in the six figure. Um, six-figure user count um, that, are, that are using this product today. Uh, awesome. Um, on a network of multiple domain controllers, can Password Auditor be installed on only one DC? No, Does, that's not going to work because uh, password well, changes filter. Oh, okay, go ahead, sorry. Right, yeah, so the, so the password po the policy um, enforcement has to be on every DC because you don't know uh, where right, the user's going to go. Right. The auditor can run against any DC. You can actually, let me back up to the original form here, um, tell us which DC to run against. That's you know, one of the first questions we ask. What DC, what OU? Um, if you have a multi-forest implementation, um, I, only have, I only have one domain in this environment, but I can target multiple domains and specify the domain controller for each one, and Auditor will just work against that one. Um, Auditor does not even need to be installed on a DC. Actually, this entire demo environment is on a Windows 11 workstation. Um, it just needs to be running as that domain account that has the, the proper access to query the DC for the information we're looking for. Okay. Wow, we're getting close down to the bottom. We're actually catching up. Man, thank you, folks. It's I love it when we come up with a topic that generates so much uh, interest. Uh, let's see here. Um, where is, what kind of company, like where is it based, Larry would like to know. 
uh, we're Spec Sovereign's Ops. point of view. Yeah, so uh, Spec Ops Software, we are headquartered in Sweden. That's where we were founded 20 plus years ago. Um, we also operate, um, I work for Spec Ops Software North America, so we are a, um, a US-based entity. Um, we have staff in multiple countries around the world, US, Canada, um, multiple locations throughout Western Europe, uh, the UK. Um, but yeah, and you, and you can see all that on our website as well about locations and and, and things like that. All right. And um, oh, does um, the Free Spec Ops Password Auditor store any of the discovered data or tel telemetry? It does not. Um, everything runs in memory and goes away as soon as you close this window. Um, Unless, of course, you choose to export a PDF report, and then that goes wherever you, you like it to. But the tool on its own, all the report data, unless you export a report, which we can do in PDF, you can do uh, CSV exports, as long as you don't do any of that, the data lives in memory, and if I close this window, the results are gone. Awesome, and I think that answers Anna's recent question. Does the free auditor maintain any data outside the org's environment, uh, especially like in spec ops systems? And um, I think your answer is no on that, just to be clear. None, none whatsoever. Um, I think I mentioned earlier where um, orgs will tell us what number of breach passwords they found, and the only way we'll know that this tool found is if a customer decides to share that information back with us through a conversation. There's no call home whatsoever in this in this utility or in the in the um, in the paid one all right um, oh <laughs> do you need egress internet connection from the domain controllers in order for the auditor to work great question no <laughs> just from the machine where you're running the auditor fantastic well um, I doubt these will be the last questions. How can people reach out to Spec Ops or to, to you, uh, Darren? At our website, there's the URL on the screen, password.specopsoft.com slash security. You can learn more about the Spec Ops password policy product or all of our products on the website there, and there'll be a contact form there as well if you're interested in learning more. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for your time. Thanks for sticking with us to have your uh, question answered, and um, we'll be in touch again soon. Thanks also to Spec Ops for making another awesome Blockbuster training session go down. We had over 1,700 people register for this. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.